everyone, and welcome to Life Hacks for Working Moms, the podcast that helps you overcome the overwhelm, embrace the chaos, and cultivate a life you love. My name is Megan Strand, and it is awesome to be here with you today. Summer is almost here, and that means it's time for me to begin my yearly garden envy. Every year, I try to plant vegetables that I hope will someday make an appearance on my family dinner table, and each year, I get a lot of zucchini. I like the idea of gardening, but for those of us not born with a green thumb, it can be a little bit intimidating, which is why I've invited not just one, but two gardening experts to join me today on the show. Lisa Rapolis and Jess Romano are with my favorite local garden center, Shorty's Garden and Home here in Vancouver, Washington. Hey, ladies. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? See, they sound alike, don't they, guys? Okay, so it's going to be interesting to try to differentiate the two of them. But they're both fabulous, with, filled with great information. So let's pretend that it's not the end of May, which, depending on when you're listening to the podcast, it might not be. So ideally... When should I be thinking about my garden? And I I think the answer is not right now. Okay, this is Lisa. I'm going to start with that one. Um, Certainly for planning for some of the cooler weather crops, we might be getting a little bit late in the year, although you'll have another chance for those in the fall. But certainly for things like tomatoes and peppers and beans and anything in the squash family, now is a great time to be planting outside. Now through the end of June really works just fine. When you say when you say cool cool weather crops, are you talking about things like beans and peas and greens? What do we define that a little bit for us? So our cool weather crops are mostly um, our greens crops. So all your lettuce family, you've got your kale and your Swiss chard. And then uh, some of your root crops as well, your beets, your carrots, turnips, things like that. Uh, Peas are definitely in that family. Beans are not. Beans are a a warm weather crop. Mm. Um, So you've got all kinds of options still at this time of year uh, in terms of those short season. Even radishes can can still go in the ground right now. Excellent. Well, and I have to, I will admit that I have a friend that's a gardener and he sent me an email in like, I don't know, it was probably February. And he said, now is time for you to plant peas, (laughs) cilantro, and kale. I think that's what he said. And so I actually have that stuff in my garden and I have crazy tall green onions. So I actually feel like I'm a little bit ahead of, ahead of the curve this year. Oh, fabulous. Fabulous. (laughs) So um, we try to encourage people that there's, there's never a bad time to plant in the year. So, you know, whether it's the the middle of winter, realistically, and you've got a sunny kitchen windowsill or whether, you know, we're running up at this time of year when it's, it's very exciting, you've got so many options in front of you. Um, with just some containers and a little bit of uh, a little bit of fertilizer, uh, you can really keep going year round. So we're we're in the best part of the year for options right now. Excellent, excellent. And then, obviously, I want to plant tomatoes. I have not bought my. I've not been to Shorty's to buy my tomato plants yet. So I know there are people who are very enterprising, like my neighbor, who start things from seed. But at this point of the year, you're looking at starts, correct? Things that are already sprouted and green. Yes, that would definitely be your best option. And we've got a great selection here at Shorty's, not only of four-inch smaller starts of tomatoes and peppers, but we also have some gallon-sized veggies that are already quite a good size and would give you a real good head start if you're just starting to think about your garden now. Excellent. Well, let's talk about tomatoes for a little bit. I wasn't going to dive real deep into any of these plants, but I feel like tomatoes are like one of the most rewarding things you can grow. But there, there's also a lot of, I don't know, I feel like there's a little bit of mystery around tomatoes. The same friend that had emailed me in February to plant these things totally laughed at me one year because we were planting tomatoes and in containers, which is the only place we could do it in the house we were living in. And they grew to be, I don't know, like six feet tall. They were ridiculous. And he just was laughing. And I'm like, what? What? It's like, you don't know how to take care of a tomato plant. I'm like, clear. no, you have to tell me. So talk a little bit about once you buy your starts from Shorty's or wherever your garden center may be when you're listening to this podcast. What do you do with tomato plants? I've heard all sorts of crazy things like you got to put fish heads into the soil. Like what do you, what's the million dollar formula for tomatoes? Well, I have to be honest. I have not tried the fish head yet myself. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of this good old prepackaged fertilizer and we do have some great high quality organic fertilizers here for sale. Um, but in terms of tomatoes, you know, and they can get huge, huge, huge. Uh, we've got two major classes of tomatoes. You've got your determinate varieties. 
So these are varieties that tend to cap out at a smaller size. You're looking at the three to five foot range or so, and they've got a slightly shorter production season. Um, your indeterminate varieties are your varieties like your Sun Golds and your Sweet 100s, and those are the varieties that just grow and grow, and as long as they have the right conditions, they'll keep going. So that six-foot tomato sounds just about right. <laughs> well, what about, because I, I, I know there was something, I, I can't remember even at the time what I was doing wrong, but I think there's definitely some pruning and plucking that needs to happen with tomato plants. So what's your advice there? Definitely. Uh, one of the most important things for tomatoes for their ideal conditions is going to be to make sure that you have some great airflow moving through there. So that's going to help to reduce disease, uh, keep the plants a lot healthier, uh, makes, them, makes for a stronger plant as well. So I would recommend removing the bottom couple leaves, uh, bottom, let's say, two sets of leaves, uh, just the very, very smallest ones when you plant. You're going to want to plant about two inches up the stem, so you can go ahead and, and put it in the ground a little bit. And then throughout the year, pruning is mostly going to consist of removing the leaders, they're called. So everywhere that a stem with leaves intersects with the main stem, you're going to see a little shoot coming out of that, um, that little L shape. And that's, that's another leader of the plant. Those need to be removed in order for the plant to perform ideally. Got it. I call those elbows. I don't know why. It's oh, like yeah. in the elbow. Take out yep, the little absolutely. start in the elbow. Somebody told me that and I was yep. like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yep. Fantastic. Well, and so we've gone a little bit down the tomato road, but let's take a little bit of a step back because I think the first thing that you need to think about in gardening and correct me if I'm wrong is the soil preparation and the planning of all of this. So what are first steps? Let's say I've got two very small little raised beds in my backyard what are the first steps in soil prep to make sure that there, that garden is ready for you to plant things in it? Because, you know, I think that's what happens to me a lot. I plant stuff and it doesn't come up or it comes up funky. And I'm like, what is going on? And I don't know what to do. Sure. Um, so the best thing to do is to make sure you start off with a really high quality soil base. And we do carry a planting mix here that is a combination of some composted fur fines, some composted manures. It's got a lot of other major nutrient components in there that your veggies are gonna need throughout their growing season. We would additionally recommend that you mix in a good compost product, <clears throat> about you know, 25 to 30% in with the, with the soil base. And that way you can add additional nutrients, additional organic matter, additional soil microbial life that's gonna be beneficial for your plant growth. So mixing in compost with your soil base, and then upon planting, you'd want to go ahead and, and, and add some additional organic slow-release fertilizer in the planting hole. Or, you know, if you're seeding a big row, you can just mix it in with, with the entire soil base before seeding. And then, you know, if you do your own composting in your yard, you can certainly add your own compost to your soil. There are lots of other ways to prepare a bed, even without, you know, building a raised bed. You could simply do lasagna gardening is a very popular method of improving your soil for a vegetable garden, and that just really consists of layering different types of organic material, kind of like you'd put a lasagna together <laughs> in the oven and then letting that sit and decompose for about six months, and then you've got a beautiful rich bed to plant directly into. Okay. So talk a little bit about that. I've never heard of that. What, what types of organic material are you talking about? Like I'm going to go dump my banana peels in my yard and put some newspaper over it. How does. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. So one of the ways that I've done it and I've seen it done is folks that have an area of their lawn that they want to convert into mm -hmm. a vegetable garden. Mm -hmm. So what you can do is just use like a digging fork and spike some holes in the, in the turf just to get some aeration and allow some access for those uh, soil microbes that are responsible for decomposition. And then over the top of that, you could spread maybe like an inch layer of a good compost material. Then you could source some cardboard, clean brown cardboard. You would just layer over that, and that will suppress the grass growth and also that adds organic material. And then on top of that, you could simply layer another several inches of compost, or you can layer alternate of browns and greens from your yard, like grass clippings, alternating with dried leaves, coffee grounds. You've got lots of options. So really, it's just it's kind of like composting in that you want to have the, a mixture of browns and greens for that carbon-nitrogen ratio. And it's not an exact science, though, especially in this sort of compost. You're not looking to get an exact recipe 
because you're going to let it sit for six months. It's going to decompose. It's going to just, you know, be beautiful. For that you. might be something you do in the fall, right? As far as the mm-hmm. lasagna. Yes. Layering. That's okay. a great time to do it. And for folks that maybe you're thinking about gardening, maybe aren't going to be able to get into it this year, but they could certainly start now preparing beds for next season's growing. Totally. That's, cool. That's about my speed. Lay things out on the yard. <laughs> Um, so going back to the soil preparation, though, do you recommend soil base, then compost mix in and some planting fertilizer and just see how it goes? Or are you recommending people actually test their soil to make sure the pH is right and all of that crazy, all of these crazy things? I know nothing about nitrogen and pH. And what is, what is the other one you test for? I know I'm showing my ignorance here. No, no, not at all. Um, and there's a lot going on in, in a healthy soil composition. Um, it, we would never recommend against testing your soil. So that's always a positive thing to do. Uh, pH tests are pretty easy to come by. Um, we also have a lot of local great resources. And I'm sure whoever is listening, I'm sure you're, you do too. Um, there's a lot of great resources with all these big universities amongst us. Um, in terms of getting your toil- soil tested for more specifics in terms of your uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium content, as well as some other micronutrients and minerals. And those are things that you can just send out for and mail in a sample and then goes to a lab and comes back to you with, with, your, um, with your breakdown. Uh, we tend to be, uh, we, we need to fertilize specifically in the Pacific Northwest, uh, largely because of our geology for one, uh, and our weather patterns for, for second. Uh, so constant fertilization is absolutely necessary. Uh, We also tend to be higher in some elements, uh, micro-elements like magnesium, and we we tend to be just slightly deficient in others such as potassium or uh, such as calcium. Um, But but it's not a it's that's not for sure, and it's always best to get tested if you're if you're really looking to do some do some digging. No pun intended. (laughs) So if you're (laughs) if you're talking about fertilizing often, what does that look like in a standard garden bed? Let's say you you, ha- you get it right and things are coming up okay. How, how do you know how often to fertilize? Depending on what family of, uh, of veggies you've got in there, you've got some options. Things like beans and peas, so your legume family essentially, I wouldn't even bother fertilizing. Those guys will just go and go. Um, the best thing to do actually is going to be to push those back into the soil If you plant them uh, with a nitrogen-fixing bacteria, uh, it it helps the nitrogen basically adhere to the roots of those legumes and makes it available uh, to the next crop that you plant back there. So beans and peas, any of your legumes, your best bet is going to be to either compost them or actually push them back into, till them back into the soil of your garden bed. And what other types of fertilizer are we th- looking at for other, like let's say tomatoes since we started talking about tomatoes. Yeah, tomatoes, definitely. Any of those fruit crops, uh, usually about every two months on those guys. And I like the granular fertilizers. They're super easy to work with. You just scratch them in right around the plants. Uh, give it a good drink when you do that. It's about every two months. It's not super frequent. Uh, not, you know, mark your calendar every week weeks or so. Um, but any of those big fruiting plants are going to need uh, need pretty constant food supply throughout the season. That makes sense. Well, and then what about, do you guys have any good tips for just kind of plotting out your garden? Because last year, it was the first year in the house that I'm in right now, and I sort of stupidly put zucchini like right in the middle of the garden and I was like that was stupid because now it took over literally one entire raised bed so this year I'm gonna I'm literally gonna plant it like on the side because it just goes and goes and goes and goes and it I don't know nobody needs that much zucchini so I don't even know if I'm gonna plant zucchini because somebody else will plant it and they'll give me some because they'll have extra One thing you can do with crops like zucchini and cucumbers, really anything in the squash family, as long as it doesn't have a real heavy fruit like a pumpkin, you can grow them vertically, just like a bean or a pea, as as long as you give them enough support. And that's something that I've done in my yard to save space and to keep them a little bit more contained. Well, and okay. So talk about, talk about the types of little trellises that you can use, because I created one that I, because I planted these beans, um, I don't think it's big enough or these peas. I don't think it's big enough. Like they're now, I feel like they're about five feet tall and my little trellis is probably four feet tall. 
So do you, what's, what's your recommendation there? Sure. One of the, tre- one of the trellises that I use in my yard all the time, just because it's materials that I tend to have around is actually rebar. <laughs> rebar works really, really well. And you can get it very cheap, especially from concrete supply stores where you can get like 20 foot lengths and they'll actually cut them down for you like to five or six foot lengths. And I just pound the rebar in the ground and I span it. You can make a pyramid or you can just, you know, make sort of a reinforced uh, you know, just two-dimensional stretch of it that you then span with like any kind mm-hmm, of wire, mm-hmm. really. You can just, and that makes a fairly sturdy trellis that I've been able to use for things like cucumbers and zucchini. But there are lots of other options too: bamboo trellising, pre-made trellises. It can be very simple. It could be a couple sticks from your yard and some twine strung between them, you know, for some of the lighter weight crops like peas and beans. And then back back to the question about thinking about how to plot out your garden. What's what's your advice there? So if I came into Shorty's and I was like, I want to plant a garden, but I don't really want to know what I want to do. And I think I like cucumbers and I really like spinach. I mean, how do you even get started and make it so that your garden doesn't look like mine did last year that was completely consumed by one plant. <laughs> it can be an artistic look. Um, our first recommendation <laughs> is going to be to grow what you love. So grow what you love to grow, grow what you love to eat. Most importantly, um, anything can work. So if, if all you love is zucchini and peas, um, it can work. Uh, <laughs> one of the things we like to take advantage of is the fact that different vegetables have different length growing season and different sun needs. So often we see customers come in uh, that are asking about shady spots in their garden or places that receive a little less sun, uh, or maybe they already planted their tomatoes, but they put them at the very southern tip of their garden, and now everything else is receiving some shade. Mm. Um, So there are options for those locations. Uh, Short season crops like peas, uh, radishes mature in just over 30 days. They're a real fast, easy thing to do. Those little salad turnips, the Hakurai turnips, they're a fabulous short season crop. Um, we like to recommend interspersing those, so planting those right alongside some longer season crops. So, for instance, your peas could grow up your tomato trellis before your tomato matures. Ooh, that's smart. So by the time the tomato is large enough, it can take over the trellis. Your peas are done. They come off, and now you've just maximized the use of that space. Um, we've also got some great companion plants and some beautiful companion plants, things like nasturtiums. Edible flowers, edible leaves, edible stems, um, great beneficial insect attractant. Takes the aphids away from a lot of your greens like chard and lettuce. Um, They can take a partial shade, so they're a fabulous thing to use up that space maybe underneath your chard or kale or in front of your or in back of your cucumber plants. Um, so we, we like to look at space. People are often, you know, just talking about some patio garden containers or, or very limited space options. And, and I guess the point is, is it can always work. Interesting. Well, and uh, yeah, you've sort of led me into one of my next questions, which is my next big problem. If I do get things to grow up, then they get eaten mostly by slugs, but also by aphids. So who's eaten our stuff and how can we keep them out of our garden, out of our food? I know they have a right to it, but it makes me so sad to see my kale just nibbled completely down to the stem. So something that I've done in my yard, I mean, it it takes a little bit of time and effort if you want to go the route of not using a lot of chemical sprays in your yard, which is my mode of operation. Um, For slugs and snails and some of those other critters, it can often mean going out at nighttime with a flashlight. (laughs) And you're actually, because that's when they're most active or early in the morning after it's, if it's nice and moist outside, that's when they're going to be outside actually munching on the crops, you know, in the middle of the sunny day when you're out there plucking around in the yard, uh, you're not necessarily going to see the critters that are doing the damage. So for slugs and snails, some early morning or late evening patrols can help. For things like aphids and some other smaller insects that munch on the crops, Honestly, for me, I think having a really great selection of flowering perennials and annuals in your yard, not necessarily in your garden beds, but nearby, you're going to attract a host of beneficial predatory bugs that are going to feed on the aphids, things like ladybugs and lacewings and other great um, beneficial insects for your yard. Uh, So really, that's the best option in my mind is to have a real diverse yard. Try not to have a monoculture, have a polyculture, a very diverse group of plantings that will attract all the beneficial critters. So when I go into my garden center, in my case, Shorty's, what am I asking for for those plants? I mean, you had mentioned one before. I can go back and listen. But what, what do I ask for if I'm looking for 
predator attractors? Well, um, so Jeff mentioned the nasturtiums earlier, which is the one that she'd already mentioned. That's a great one. That's a, a, a great annual uh, beneficial flower for your yard. Um, some great perennial options would be anything in like the salvia or the hyssop families. Those tend to attract not only hummingbirds, but a whole host of some of the parasitic wasps that do fabulous work. I mean, they're kind of, their mode of operation is a little gross, but they, uh, they essentially lay their eggs inside the bodies of other no insects. Way. And then the other insects kind of get eaten from the inside out, but they do a great job. So um, yeah, there's, and, and Jess may have some other suggestions she could offer as well. Um, definitely with the, uh, I have to say, I've never met a hornworm caterpillar that I really liked and watching them get in, eaten from the inside out was a, a very satisfying thing. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add one more thing about uh, about aphids in particular, um, just in my research in the past, and uh, I've found that watering makes a huge difference, how you water, when you water. Um, so watering in the morning is really important because the plants are going to be taking up the majority of their water during the day when the sun is out and they're getting thirsty. Um, the other really important thing is, and one of the things that tends to attract a lot of those little guys is wet leaves. So when you're watering, if you have the option to put down some drip tape or some hoses, uh, some, some just drip hoses, such that the watering is being done at the base of the plant rather than on top of the plant, that tends to cut down on at least attracting those guys. It's the overhead watering, the sprinklers, um, you know, just kind of taking the hose out and spraying everything. Uh, the, the wetter those leaves get, the less happy the plant tends to be. It can fry some plants in some extreme heat. Uh, but I, I would definitely recommending watering. So in the morning, at the roots, uh, very deeply. It's, it's not just something you want to shower over. So and less often is the other big piece of that. And that, that can make a huge difference in the pests that you see coming around. And by less often, what do you mean? Well, instead of going through and watering just a little bit, you know, every couple of days, I would... Uh, I would wait until the soil dries out, if the plant can stand it, but just the very top, um, stick your finger in, poke around the plant a little bit, pay attention to it, see if it's starting to keel over or not. Things like basil really love to dry out a little bit in between watering. So are, are, are you thinking, is it like four days, typically, with, if, if it's not raining, let's say? It's going to vary. I, I would keep your eye. I would do a little bit of independent research on this one. It's going to vary on your area, how much rain we're having, what month it is, et cetera. Um, but uh, but you, your plants will tell you. <laughs> Stick your finger in there. Keep an eye on it. It could be every day in the heat of the summer, honestly, um, and it could be once a week at other times of the year. Got it. So it depends on lots of different things. Excellent. Well, this has been so fascinating and I am so motivated to now keep con taking care of my garden. And I'm really excited about these, uh, what were you calling them? Like companion plants? Is that what you call them? Yeah. Beneficial companion. Beneficial plant companion plants. plants. Uh -huh. I'm excited about that. So I definitely need to make a trip into shorties. Do you guys have any online resources that you might recommend in addition to going to shorties and your, and or your local garden center, if you don't happen to have the benefit of living around here? Any other online resources that you recommend? Yes, most definitely. Um, for folks living in our area, they should definitely check out the WSU Extension website, um, gardening.wsu.edu. Um, they've got an extensive uh, collection of publications. I mean, it's really an excellent resource. And for folks living in other parts of the country, most major universities have extensions um, you know, that are associated with Master Gardener programs, for instance, and they most of them have great online resources for folks as well. Perfect. And then what about shorties? If you happen to live in the area, how can you find shorties? And what other... How can you find shorties online? Sure. So we've got two locations for shorties in our area. We've got one here on Mill Plain Boulevard. It's 10006 Mill Plain. And we've got another one that's just at the intersection of 10th and 199th up in Ridgefield. And uh, we have a great website. They can find us at www.shortiesgardenandhome.com. And we have a wonderful rewards program that uh, if folks get signed up, they not only earn points for uh, future discount shopping, but they'll get weekly emails from us with some great tips and tricks, what's new in the store, and also a list of our uh, a calendar of our events and classes that are coming up. 
Excellent. And I would highly recommend that email sign up because it really, really is fabulous. Lots of great tips in there. So please check out Shorties online, or if you happen to live in the Vancouver area, do check them out in person if you haven't already. And you can find all of today's show notes at the website lh the number four wm.com or just lifehacksforworkingmoms.com. You can find me on Twitter at Megan Strand as well as Facebook at Lifehacks for Working Moms. I do recommend you subscribe to the podcast in iTunes so that you don't miss an episode. And if you're so compelled, I would love it if you would write a review for the show. On behalf of Lisa and Jess and myself, we'd like to thank you so much for joining us today get out there and garden, no matter where in the world you live. I'll talk to you next time.